just want to thank everyone for attending the symposium today, which is sponsored by the Academy of Infection Management, or AIM. Uh, as you know, this is an organization that focuses on infections, particularly in hospitalized patients. And the symposium today will have three uh, lectures. Ollie will be giving the first one on C. difficile. Uh, the second one will be by Tiago Lisboa, who will be talking about Staph aureus. And then Carlos Luna will be giving a lecture on ventilator-associated pneumonia with some updates. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, everyone has their lunch. They're sitting down. If one wants more information on the organization AIM, which is sponsoring this, we have the website here as well as the Twitter name uh, so that for you could get access to the presentations from today as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and really just present a brief case. C. difficile infection is something that we see in the intensive care unit too often. Uh, it can actually be a devastating problem for patients. This is one example of a patient who is a 51-year-old man who underwent uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. And as you can see here, over a period of several days, his condition worsened, uh, in part because of some antibiotics that he received earlier. And in fact, he had the onset of diarrhea approximately one week after his bypass surgery, and shortly thereafter, his white count had gone up to 65,000, and he died shortly thereafter. So this is a problem. It's a devastating problem for patients when it occurs because it's unexpected. We know that the pathophysiology of this syndrome has been well described. This is a nice review article that appeared in JAMA recently, really highlighting for us the fact that this is a toxin-induced syndrome. And in fact, to a large part, we have spores that enter into the GI tract. They sporulate. One has the organism. The organism interacts with the innate immune system of the host, depending on the intactness of that immune system. Infection can occur locally, overwhelming local defense mechanisms, resulting in the clinical syndrome of C. difficile. And if the infection is not treated correctly, recurrences can occur. There are many things that predispose to this infection. This is just a partial list. Certainly antibiotics are important, as are other medications, including chemotherapeutic agents and steroids. Radiation therapy can affect the local milieu of the gut. Host factors are important as well. We know that older patients, women, particularly postpartum women, may be at higher risk. And there also may be environmental factors that play a role in predisposing to this infection. When we look at the antibiotics, and again, this is from uh, the review article in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published recently, not all antibiotics are the same in predisposing to this infection. Certainly some of the beta-lactams and clindamycin have a much higher association with C. difficile infection whereas others are less common, including the tetracyclines as well as some of the carbapenems. The diagnosis can be made in a number of different ways. Certainly endoscopy can be helpful. This is just showing, for example, a patient with a normal colon and someone who has a pseudomembrane present as a result of C. difficile, keeping in mind that there are other pathogens that can cause the same picture. CT scan can be helpful in terms of demonstrating the presence of a dilated colon mucosal wall thickening, as well as pericolonic fluid that may be present. And certainly biopsies are the gold standard here, but they're rarely ever done. And the biopsy, again, will show evidence of the pseudomembrane that's forming, as well as the inflammatory changes and mucosal destruction. How we make the diagnosis is usually based on the detection of toxin. And there are a number of different assays that are available. The more sensitive and specific ones include the PCR-based tests. They tend to be somewhat more expensive. In the past, it was more common to do immunoassays for toxin A and B. They were somewhat less reliable and oftentimes needed to be repeated in order to increase the overall sensitivity of the test. But we now have more sensitive immunoassays that are available to us. And again, this comes from the recent review paper in JAMA highlighting these. I think most places now have been moving towards PCR and similar molecular methods. When we look at data from the US, we can see that over a period of time through 2005, the prevalence and occurrence of C. difficile was on the rise, particularly in the elderly. And the elderly are at much higher risk for this infection, and they're also at much higher risk for mortality when this infection occurs. More recent data, again, from the US suggests that when we look at this, about a third of these infections occur in the community. 
And in fact, they often present to the gastroenterologists and primary care physicians. But the ones that we tend to be most interested in are the ones that occur in the healthcare setting. And of those, we can see that roughly one third of them are hospital acquired, about a third of them are nosocomially acquired, and about 20% occur outside of the hospital, but in the healthcare setting, including nursing homes and long-term care settings. This is actually an update of the slide I showed you earlier going through 2010 and beyond, giving us some estimates as to what we're expecting to see with C. difficile infection again in the US. The overall rise in the infection has slowed down, maybe even plateaued in some of the segments here, but it is still a very prevalent nosocomial infection. We actually carried out a study a few years ago looking at this, and this was the largest study done in the intensive care setting between Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, the Mayo Clinic, and Creighton University. And in this particular study, we looked at patients who had C. difficile infection that occurred in patients who were on the mechanical ventilation for at least 48 hours. And we had almost 6,000 patients that were enrolled in this study, and this was an epidemiologic study. As you can see here, we had 386 out of the population, roughly about 7%, that actually developed C. difficile infection. So that was the prevalence of C. difficile in this critically ill patient population. When we compared these patients to patients who had no C. diff infection, there were some differences. Surprisingly, the C. diff patients were a little older, but not much older, only about two and a half years. The patients who had C. difficile infection were less likely to have end-stage renal disease, but they were more likely to have end-stage liver disease. And in fact, that became important because as I'll show you later, that was a predictor of mortality in those patients as well and the Apache 2 scores were somewhat lower. So it almost appears as if this infection was occurring more often in patients with a somewhat lower severity of illness. When we actually looked at the three hospitals, the more common occurrence numerically was in Barnes Jewish Hospital, but when we looked at it as per 1,000 patient days, one can see that there was a stratification here. And the stratification correlated with severity of illness. The patients in the hospital with the highest severity of illness seem to have a higher occurrence rate of the infection. The timing of the diagnosis was interesting too. About 70% of these occurred in the ICU setting in these patients. About 20% occurred prior to the ICU, meaning the patient brought the C. difficile into the intensive care unit when they required mechanical ventilation for more than two days and about 12% of the patients developed their infection immediately after leaving the ICU going to the hospital floor. But again, the majority of these are occurring in the ICU in these patients, and it really requires that we have some mechanisms in place for being aware of this and screening for this in the right population. We also found that there was a significant number of these patients who developed severe C. difficile infection. And the way that was defined here, as you can see, was an elevated temperature greater than 38.5, roughly 22%. Similarly, with a Y count greater than 20%, almost 23%. And signs of peritonitis were present in about 7% of these patients, ileus in about 5%. And septic shock, surprisingly, occurred in one-third. And that was one of the things we were most surprised about that about a third of these patients in the ICU with C. diff during mechanical ventilation actually required vasopressors and developed a septic shock picture. And so again, we see this occurred in about a third of the patients. It's important because early recognition of this and proper treatment can result in improved outcome and reduce mortality. The toxic megacolon is important to diagnose because many of those patients may go on to require surgery as long as they're appropriate surgical candidates. And in fact, in this particular survey, almost 4% of the patients did go for colectomy. And that's a number that's somewhat similar to others that are reported in the literature, although one can find reports of even higher levels of surgical intervention depending on the population studied. When we looked at the outcomes of our patients for those that had C. diff infection in the red bars versus those that did not in the blue bars, again, we found no difference in mortality. So it did not appear that this infection was resulting in excess mortality or attributable mortality, but what it did do was it affected other outcomes. 
so that the patients who had C. diff infection complicating mechanical ventilation were more likely to require transfer from the hospital to a nursing home. And in fact, they were less likely to go home. Not only that, but those patients with C. diff infection had longer hospital lengths of stay and significantly longer ICU lengths of stay. So the infection was prolonging the illnesses of these individuals, including their ICU stay. And this just shows the mortality stratified by Apache scores, again demonstrating that there was no difference in mortality for these patients as a result of the C. diff infection. When one looks at the C. diff infected patients alone to identify what the risk factors for mortality were in this population, not surprisingly, end-stage liver disease was an independent predictor of mortality. Patients who were transferred from the hospital floor to the ICU had a higher risk of mortality. That might imply that there was some delay in making the diagnosis and getting treatment started. Higher Apache scores were associated with higher mortality, as was shock. The need for vancomycin enemas actually had the highest odds ratio. And we think that was the case because these are the patients who often have ileus, they often are the sickest patients, and so the vancomycin enema may be a marker of patients with more severe disease. And this just shows us the box plots, again demonstrating the significant differences in lengths of stay, both in the ICU and in the hospital for patients with the infection. And this was actually confirmed in a Cox model, and the Cox model shows that C. diff infection was an independent predictor for prolongation of the hospital stay. The other interesting thing for which there was not much data in the past was how often did these patients develop recurrent infection, recognizing that the initial infection occurred in the ICU. And in fact, the overall recurrence rate of C. diff in these patients was about 13%. The most interesting part of this was about 90% of these, almost 90%, occurred after they were discharged from the hospital. So this is an example where the patient leaves the hospital and then the nosocomial infection recurs while they're outside. When we looked at the risk factors for recurrence of their C. diff infection, the only variable that fell out was the presence of COPD. And we think that may have to do with the fact that the COBD patients may be more debilitated, they're more likely to be on corticosteroids, and they're obviously more likely to get antibiotic therapy. So those may be factors predisposing them to recurrence. The other interesting thing was that when we looked at the patients who had a recurrence of C. difficile, if there was no recurrence, only about 3% of them required a readmission to the hospital. If they had a recurrence of their disease, almost a third required re-hospitalization. So again, relapse or recurrence of the disease results in more hospitalization. And in this particular study that we did when we looked at a multivariate analysis, recurrent C. difficile infection was associated with the highest odds of requiring readmission to the hospital. So it really suggests that these patients who have C. diff that leave the hospital need to be followed carefully to determine whether or not recurrent infection occurs. And that was actually verified by this study from a French intensive care unit, which also showed no difference in mortality but longer lengths of stay, and these patients also had a significant rate of recurrence. Now, one of the things that's known is in the intensive care unit, and this is actually a study that we published a few years ago with our infection control group, that the burden of C. difficile in the ICU predicts infection, meaning the more patients that are carriers and are infected with C. diff, the higher the likelihood that additional patients will become infected, so a greater burden. And what we did was we carried out a study. Even though we had no epidemic C. diff, we had an endemic level of C. difficile in our medical and surgical ICUs, we instituted an infection control program whereby what we did was if someone was found to be C. diff positive, they were placed on isolation, all the surfaces in their rooms were cleaned daily with a Clorox solution, and the housekeepers would clean their rooms last, meaning they would take care of all the non-C. diff rooms before going into the C. diff positive rooms. And we found that this very simple approach actually reduced our rates of C. difficile in both the medical and the surgical ICU settings. Now lastly, let me make a few comments about the fact that this is a disease that interacts with the host immune system. I mentioned the fact that when we talk about the gut mucosa, we have both innate and adaptive immune functions. 
There have been several approaches trying to take advantage of this. Certainly affecting the microbiome of the gut has been looked at with the use of probiotics. This is a study that we did with Lee Morrow where it was a randomized control trial applying a probiotic twice a day in mechanically ventilated patients in the upper airway and the stomach, lactobacillus GG versus placebo. And in fact, in this particular study, which is the largest RCT that's been done to date in the ventilated population, one can see that not only did the ventilator-associated pneumonia rates drop, but the rate of C. difficile-associated infection, as well as non-C. diff diarrhea, were both reduced. And a recent meta-analysis examining this issue in elderly patients also found that lactobacillus, as well as other probiotics, could be beneficial in reducing the occurrence of C. difficile-associated diarrhea. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just wanted you to be aware of this because this is from the study or review paper that came out recently in JAMA about two months ago, just highlighting the treatment regimen. And the most important thing is to recognize that for the patients who have severe infection in the ICU, one has to increase the dosing of the treatment with oral vancomycin. And so the recommendations are 125 to 500 milligrams by mouth four times daily. In our intensive care unit, we give at least 250 milligrams in these patients, particularly those in the ICU on the ventilator. And the other thing is we oftentimes will combine it with IV flagella metronidazole. So double or triple therapy is often given in these patients depending on their severity of illness. There are other agents that have been looked at. This is a partial listing of the ones that are listed here. Certainly metronidazole and vancomycin have the longest track record and experience. Vidoxamycin is a drug that had a trial published about three years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that one could have fewer recurrences with that particular agent. But again, those were not critically ill patients. And then there are a number of other drugs shown here that may be used as salvage therapies. Surgical indications, I think, are pretty straightforward. If you have bowel perforation, severe fulminant colitis, refractory shock, or peritonitis with impending perforation, those would all be considered immediate reasons for operation if the patient is an adequate candidate. And then there are others that might be considered secondary in patients who are not as acutely ill. In addition, there are some new techniques that have been developed. One that's caught some popularity in some centers in the U.S. is placing essentially a secostomy tube in and then irrigating out the bowel and then placing vancomycin directly into the large colon. Probably the thing that's created the most interest is the use of fecal transplants. And as this sign says, uh, we have marijuana shops in the U.S. now. Now we also have poop shops, if you will, where you can get your fecal transplant. And the issue here is that the data is actually looking pretty good for this. And it's becoming more and more utilized in patients who have refractory problems, more so on the outpatient setting than in the inpatient setting, although I think that will come as well. And this is actually from the CID paper a few years ago, looking at patients who had refractory recurrent C. difficile infection, looking at the numbers of patients who resolved with the use of a fecal transplant. And again, one can see here that the numbers were, on average, 90% or more who had resolution and very little mortality in that population. We know from other studies, including this one in the New England Journal of Medicine, although a small comparative study, that when you look at patients who had recurrent disease, those that are treated with a fecal transplant seem to do better compared to using traditional antibiotic therapy from the standpoint of not having any further relapses and having improvement in their overall symptom scores. So again, this looks like a very promising technique and we'll see more of it. The other approach that's been looked at since we know many patients who develop C. diff infection have lower levels of innate antibody production against toxin in A and B is to essentially immunize them with a monoclonal antibody. And this is a study that was done looking at monoclonal antibodies A and B given directly to patients, one can see that compared to patients who do not receive the drug, one can achieve a significant increase in the circulating monoclonal antibody levels that are present for at least 90 days. And in fact, in those patients who got treated with monoclonal antibodies, again, they had less recurrence of their infection. So I'm going to summarize and just say that C. difficile infection is a very important infection in the ICU population, particularly for patients on mechanical ventilation. Although there may not be an increase in mortality, there certainly is an increase in morbidity and costs 
There should be programs in place to actively try to prevent the infection and make the diagnosis as early as possible to institute early appropriate therapy in order to improve clinical outcomes. Thank you.